Good afternoon, I'm Graham Fitch. Welcome to this uh, month's version of um, the live practice clinic that we're doing on Facebook. Um, I'm co-founder of the Online Academy and what we do in these monthly clinics is I, I'm going to address questions that are sent in by Online Academy subscribers. I see Veronique is there. Hi Veronique. Uh, so if anybody else is there, please do let me know where you're uh, watching from and we will respond to the comments. I can't respond to the comments as we go along, but um, Ryan will be there, I think, uh, addressing things as they come up and I will have a look afterwards and, and see what people have said. So let me just introduce the, the concept. So the, the idea of practice clinic as distinct from technique cl clinic is really to do with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in our practice room. What do we do to install the notes, the music into our brains, into our bodies um, on a day-to-day -day basis? Ah, oh, now people are starting to arrive. Hello there. Um, and, and I think that's really something that's often not taught, which is why we set up the Online Academy in the first place, to address mostly uh, practice-related queries, but it's now expanded to embrace all sorts of other uh, important aspects of piano playing, such as technique, um, improvisation, all sorts of things that we've got going on in there. So let me just get straight ahead with the first question that comes to us from Betty, who says, in Pianist Magazine issue 124, the Serenata Andalutha by Manuel de Falla in bars, from bars 1 to 16. Could you suggest some practice strategies? I'm having trouble keeping it light enough. Also, I have a very small hand and the left hand arpeggios are not very fluid. Well, OK, Betty, I think the first thing um, to say about this is just if we look at the indication from the composer, he's marked pianissimo leggero. Now, leggero is it means light, but the implication is a staccato touch. Even though we find phrase marks often uh, when we see the word leggero, uh, very often it's just implying something that's not too legato, but, but out of the keyboard. And I think that would be the key here, not to put stuff into the keyboard, but to lift it out. So if I just let me play the first few bars. Um... And it goes on a little bit stronger there. The dynamic is, is there after forte. So if I just do slowly, I'm not sure that you can see that high in the keyboard. Let me do it a little lower so you'll be able to, to see it. So trouble, I'm operating from my phone here. So this is with no pedal, but we do have both pedals down. Can you see what I'm doing there? I'm thinking of each paired slur as a group down up and I'm lifting. I'm not holding on to the dotted quaver, the dotted eighth note but I'm releasing it. Um, down, up. When the pedal's down. Uh, bear in mind that's an octave too low because I don't think you could see my keyboard up there. Um, lift, lift. Now in the left hand, the same idea. I, I've just figured out here, let me see if I can put my camera a bit further back uh, in the hope that my equipment doesn't fall off the table. Here we go. So what I'm doing is is lifting. Let me do it without the pedal just to show you. Down, up. I'm coming out of the keyboard. Up, up. And when I lift, I'm very free in the arm. I'm very, therefore, very mobile because if I'm free, I'm able to move. So that octave distance is, is nothing for me. You can either do two, five. If you want it a little closer, one, three. So one, three. I quite like uh, the, the two because, you know, when we cross the body like this, um, the second finger is somewhat more accessible to the keyboard than the thumb. If I put the thumb on there, I feel a little awkward in the position. So two five suits me and maybe even two five there, or you could do one three there. You could do one three here as well. When I put the pedal, it's a very light pedal. Um, I think if, if I were preparing this for any kind of performance, I'd want to practice my right hand again. I'm going to do it too low. I'd, wa 
want to feel it once or twice legato without any dotted rhythm that gives me the contours and also that it helps with the position shifts and then I hope that gives you something to go on there Betty now the next question is from Nesta who says how do we go about playing a two octave arpeggio using the single and double rotation without stretching of the fingers. I find this technique a little awkward, especially when negotiating the next octave. Right, uh, Nesta, the first thing to say is that's a very specifically, uh, uh, the, the question is targeted very specifically to a Taubman specialist, and I'm not a Taubman, Taubman specialist. I have high regard for the, for the methodology, and I know uh, a fair bit about it, but I'm not specializing in that particular area. So what I'll do is I will address the question from my own perspective, um, just bringing in maybe something of what you're uh, hoping, hoping for. Um, it, okay, so there are two things to say here. One is um, the, old, the old fashioned way of playing arpeggios with the thumb under. It, 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 we, we, we've got to be very careful here not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's nothing wrong with a thumb under if it's not uncomfortable. Um, the more modern approach is to do a shift, an arm shift. So when we're playing an arpeggio, instead of, instead of putting the thumb under here, which I find perfectly comfortable, because my hand is big, that's the thumb under approach. Instead of doing that, what we, we could do is just a shift. We have to find a way of minimizing, minimizing the gap um, between the third finger or the fourth finger, whichever finger you use, um, and the next thumb note. And, and I'll show you a few, a few thoughts on that. Um, but if I, if I show you the, the, the both of these so that you can explore both of them. Now, if you've got only a small interval, between the third finger and the thumb. There's nothing uncomfortable, and I can add my rotation there as well. Do you see what I'm doing there? And then coming over, the rotation would go in the other direction from right to left. Do you see how I'm moving from thumb to three? So that's the, that's the rotation, but if you were to map it with singles and doubles, that's a whole other um, experience. So there's my single. Sorry, yeah, there's my single and a double to a single to a single. And you notice that what in both examples, my thumb is moving in toward my hand. And I think that's the clue to avoid the stretches is first of all, to just look at your thumb and to see what it's doing. So I, I would think in, in pairs of fingers, one, two, then two to three, and then three to one. Do you see? So every time I play the next note, my hand is re regrouping, um, closing up, if you will. So I could stop on any note and experience just a balanced hand, balanced on that finger. Now there, I would want to feel the opening in my, um, in my hand toward the next octave. And I think that's maybe what you're sensing there. I find this technique a little awkward, especially when negoti negotiating the next octave. So, in, in, the, in the thumb under approach, what we could do here is to hold the thumb down, play the note before and the note after. Now I'm sensing there that my wrist is very free uh, laterally. Got to be careful to use the, the fingering that I would. Two here, three here. Now you would notice that I'm keeping my elbow in one, one place. I'm not allowing my elbow to drop. And my elbow is actually quite high. Play the, the note either side of the thumb. So that's the E, I'm playing an A major arpeggio here. So E, A, C sharp, A. Again, keeping the wrist as free and flexible as possible and the elbow in one spot. And then when I come to my arpeggio itself, I've got to add some horizontal movements of my forearm, my arm, so that I can. I can follow the direction of the of the arpeggio and the arm leads. That's the that's the important thing. We want to have the arm moving already before we even almost before we start the arm is moving. So 
that's the thumb under approach, which if you've got a small hand is more problematic, especially if I would play that arpeggio in the second inversion. Because, see I'm sitting badly. I should be sitting like this to play the piano, I'm not sitting like this, but I'm doing it just so I can communicate with my audience here. So um, the, the second inversion would involve a bigger interval, an interval of a fourth. very well want to just do the shift. Now let me just show you one or two things about the arm shift and I think if I show you in the right hand now um, what I'm going to do is instead of putting my thumb under I'm going to throw my hand toward the, the A, toward the next thumb. Now is it legato? Yes it sounds pretty much legato. Um, it's slightly deceptive because it's not actually completely legato, it just sounds legato. So therefore it's legato as, an, as opposed to a physical, real physical join. The gap is so small. And what you could do for practice, and I quite like this, I call it target practice. Let me change the key. Now I'm got, what I'm going to do is to land on different notes with my thumb and I'm going to use the chromatic scale. So I first of all throw my hand to, to the E. I'm using now an E major. Then I go up. Do you see how reliable that is? I can go up as far as I want. So what I'm sensing when I release my third finger, apart from the throw, which is a very nice, loose, free movement, I've got a little bit of a rotational uh, release as well. So if I do that in slow motion, the thing with rotations, you can't really do them in slow motion. They have to be fast at the point of rotation. So one, two, three, but I'm going to do it. Imagine this is slow motion action replay. So I'm going to, as though I'm going to roll over on my nail, the right side of my nail, I'm not going to get that far. And then I release, do you see how the release happens? Slow motion would look something like that but it's a smaller version and it feels really free it feels to me spring-loaded so and, and if i'm aware of the finger the third finger before the throw then i can get a really good release from the third finger if the third finger's floppy my, i'm not going to have anything to jump off from so we we have to be aware when we're making any kind of jump like that of the finger before the jump has to be solid enough to support um, the throw. So then, so just be aware of the two different ways that we can uh, manage arpeggios. So the thumb under or the thumb over. It's not really over, but it, it, it's this sense that the thumb is, instead of going under the hand, the thumb is coming over the hand and releasing that way. So the next question is from Richard, who, let me just get, make sure I'm in the right page here. Yeah, so Richard asks about the Moonlight Sonata, third movement, bar eight. He says, I have seen diminished seventh chords spelled with intervals of the augmented second instead of thirds. What am I missing? Okay, well, we, we, we all know the Moonlight Sonata, third movement. The spot that Richard's talking about... <laughs> corner there this bar now that's not a diminished chord it's a it's known as a German sixth it's a chord of the augmented sixth. let me just unpack that a little bit so we're in the key of C sharp minor here so if I play a scale of C sharp minor um, let me just actually do G sharp because we're going toward the dominant key here so that's G sharp minor to the seventh degree, I've got to call that something to do with F. So G happens to be a G sharp, A, B, C, D, E, F, but I have to call it an F double sharp because it's got to be called, it's got to be referred to by the letter name F because a scale is consecutive letter names. So that's why we call it an F double sharp instead of a G. We can't have two G's in a scale. So F double sharp, G sharp. So in this chord, let me just take the scale of C sharp minor now. There's 
is my flattened sixth degree, and if I add the augmented sixth above it, that's going to be some sort of F, so it's F double sharp, because I need a sixth, A, B, C, D, E, F. I have to call it uh, in relation to the, to the letter name F. So A natural, F double sharp, right? Now, if I want to make the Italian sixth, I add the tonic, which is the C sharp. If I want to make the French sixth, I add the D sharp, the second degree of the scale. And if I want to make the German sixth, I, I play the E instead of the D sharp. So it sounds like, if I were to take it out of context, it sounds like a dominant seventh. It doesn't function as a dominant seventh. So if I play the harmonic progression um, without all of the notes, just the bare bones, the harmony, you'll hear how that sounds. us to the dominant chord, G-sharp major chord. You can feel how that works. These two notes pull out to the G-sharp. The bass goes down and the soprano goes up and that, that creates the, the tension, if you will. So Derek, um, this is our last question. Derek has uh, just started learning the C major Rhapsody by Doknani and he is struggling with the opening section. How to nail the first few bars and how to play the second theme lightly and with character. And then also from bar 35, I find my right hand seizing up uh, with the double notes and I just can't coordinate. I'm looking forward to hearing your advice. Okay, well, this is a great fun piece. It's actually a very silly piece, um, but it's got some really good tunes in it as well. One particularly uh, big, lush, romantic tune that sounds a little bit like Brahms uh, sometimes to me or sometimes it feels like Elgar it's just a big big broad tune but the, at the beginning we've got this introduction that th where the right hand is kind of thrown around over the keyboard and the left hand climbs up uh, let me see if I can do it <laughs> play that that I really can't be looking up at my score I need to be looking down at my hands for this um, it would be very distracting to have to make all those jumps kind of blind so the first thing I would do it would be to memorize it now let me just show you the, the sorts of things I would do for that I, I have a tool for memory I call it PPR which is personalized pattern recognition and it's not just for memory it's for learning notes as well you know learning pieces um, where I recognize designs, it could be formal, as in, you know, ABA structures or harmonies, as we've just been looking at. But it could also be what, whatever patterns I notice as, as meaningful to me to help me to absorb this material. When I look at the left hand, I'm immediately drawn to the left hand because it seems to be leading the right hand. I'm noticing if I miss out the middle note, I've got a chromatic scale. E to C. So then I could just play that now looking down at the keyboard. I've memorized that. Two, one, two, right. That's just the first uh, three bars. Now the other note that's in the middle of the left hand, I'm noticing is a major third above the pinky note. If I wanted to bed that into my hand, there's all sorts of things I could do. One is to play everything together, but play the, the middle note two or three times. And notice there I've got all white notes, all black notes, all white notes, a mixture, 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 mixture in there, and then all whites again. I could also do this, I could play my pinky first, and then double back and forth between the five and the three and so on that will be very good to do to just bed that into the hand do the same thing uh, with, with between the one and the three I could play the middle note first and then the outer notes first and then the middle note 
and use the middle note as a springboard until my hand gets used to the feeling. Um, that feels actually really nice in my hand. So now I, I think I've memorized that left hand. Fine, I'm happy with that. I don't need to look up at my page. Now, it might take me a bit longer um, to, to get that into your system, but that, those would be the stages I do. You might need to repeat those stages the day after and the day after that. And after a while, you'll start to notice the left hand the, the, the kinesthetic sense of where the hand is on the keyboard, you'll start to notice it, just go there. With a little bit of patience, maybe. So, now let's look at the right hand. Well, if I remove the middle note, I notice I've just got a whole bunch of E's. This E in the lower octave, and then a jump, and then again, So I, maybe I could add just that to my left hand. And if that's a bit too complicated to start with, why don't I just go back to my octave chromatic scale? Whoops. Now you'll notice there that I'm doing this rather softly, and I think this is important. When we've got something that's supposed to be loud, we don't need to practice it loudly. Uh, why? Well, there's several things. One, we want to preserve our good sound quality. We want to minimize the vertical. And when we play loudly, we tend to focus on the vertical aspect of putting keys down. When we play lighter, we've got the more horizontal. And music tends to work more, more well, I think better in horizontal lines than downward vertical lines. So I don't need my pedal yet, but I'm happy with that. Now let me put my third back in, in the left hand. Noticing there that there's something not quite working at the top. So I discover there that I need to release round so that I can come back. So as I'm holding onto that E at the top, can you see I'm releasing in the upper arm so that I can come back to my lower position. Now if I look a little closer at the middle notes, aha, they're just chromatic. But they go from one octave to another, they don't go straight. But supposing I played it straight like this. In other words, all in the same octave, I'd get a better appreciation of the design of that. Aha, now let me see if I can throw that around. And I'm aware of my middle finger. That's better. Now my arm is behaving better at the top. So I could, again, just play my second finger. It's not always second finger. Here it's second. Here it's third. Fourth. See, I can try that against the left hand middle finger. Do you see how I'm kind of figuring that out, the design of the thing, so that I don't have to rely on my page. Now, I've got that working nicely and it's memorized. And it, I, I memorized it as I learned the notes. It wasn't learning the notes first and then memorizing, it was kind of together. Now the second theme, let me just play how he gets into the second theme. Very pompous and grand this opening so we're expecting something very important to happen now instead we get this silly little um, idea something even sillier. <laughs> it's like laughter, isn't it? It's the musical equivalent of, of laughter. Um, 
let's just look at what's involved in this uh, second theme. Let me just do it slower for you again. I think I'll have to do it an octave lower. Well, my right hand has to do uh, a couple of things there. It has to play a tune on the top. And then it has a th thumb note that's in there as well. Now, because because we've got staccatos there, we, the, the thought might, might be just to release the keys, but actually, the closer I can keep to my keyboard, the better. This is an octave too low. Do you see what I'm doing there? And I'm using the tips of my fingers, reactive in the tips. I need that focus in the tip. That kind of quality. Now, uh, Derek had said here, uh, from bar 35, I find my right hand seizing up with the double notes and I can't seem to coordinate. Okay, so that's bar 35 is this spot. See how much use he gets out of the uh, chromatic scale. Chromatic octaves. Now, the right hand is this. This is the bit that, that Derek's um, not happy with. Okay, now when you look at that first, at first glance, we notice it's just the, the hand can kind of sit over that whole position and just play it as a block. And actually blocking is a very good way to learn this to start with. Let me just show you what that would sound like. Nothing's changed in the right hand yet until here. Then the left hand takes over the, the block. modulation into a D flat major um, just for the fun of it I think right now to play that we we had better not stick in that fixed hand position because that's where the uncoordinated uh, feelings come from I would imagine that for Derek so let me just explain that a bit if I would play that block and now try and play one four two five in alternation from that fixed position starts to feel a little bit uh, harder after a while. It starts not to feel so great in the hand. So what we need to do there is just to move. Can you see what I'm doing? I've got one position for the 4-1 and a slightly different position for the 5-2. To find it, what we can do is just to land in the 4-1 and just see where our arm is in relation to our hand. When I move to 5 and 2, there's an adjustment, little adjustment in my wrist, laterally. So my thumb isn't clinging to the E um, when I go up to the upper pair. It's not far off, but I, I have moved my thumb a little bit. And then I feel like I'm dancing on my keyboard. see it better here. Not this, but just throw the hand. Very small movements, but it, it's, it's enough to make the, the difference. I think we're done for today. That's the last question. Um, I hope that's been of some help to those that asked the, put the questions forward and, and of some interest to those that are, are watching it. If you should be watching on Facebook, um, you can put comments. If you're watching on YouTube, you can still put comments, but you can also subscribe. Uh, you can click in, on the subscribe button um, or hit it if you want, if you're not frightened of breaking the glass. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you next time. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions. See you soon.